Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, Coast Guard, or National Guard or Reserves, you've come to the right place. American Warrior Radio, right here on the Talk To Me station, AM 1300, and online worldwide at 1300WMEL.com. Sponsored by AVAT Project. Folks, this program is all about supporting our troops and their families, both past and present. So please get comfortable, grab a cup of coffee because it's cold outside, and a pencil and paper to jot down a note or two because we're always efforting to bring you important information that you can use and share with others. With that said, let's roll down the runway and get this show off the ground. I'm Glenn McGuffey former manager of the Brevard County Veterans Services Team and retired Air Force. But I don't do this show alone. Along with me is my co-host. That would be me, Garen Cohn, and y'all know me. I'm an Air Force veteran, a retired legal advocate for veterans, and founder of AVET Project. And Glenn, we've got a tremendous show here today. We've got, literally, folks, when you go to YouTube and you view this particular episode, you're going to see we've got papers spread out all over the broadcast desk here because there's so many things we want to address. It's um, it's one of those type of days where we're going to bring you a lot of information. and Potpourri! We, yeah, and we want to start with, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll have some announcements but we want to start with something that's always pressing, and we're always getting emails and phone calls and Facebook messages about presumptive service-connected disorders. All right, presumptive, what exactly does that mean? That means that the Veterans Administration, through the National Institutes of Health and all the other organizations that compile these lists, come to the conclusion that if you were in a particular war period or combat zone where you may have been exposed to something that causes long-term chronic disorders. Okay, most familiar would be Agent Orange disorders. Yeah, exactly. Chronic, of course, being a continuing disorder. But that isn't the only category of veterans that are affected by what we term presumptive service-connected disorders. Glenn, what's another one? Well, another one is... Uh, ALS, or Lou Gehrig's disease, probably a, some of our younger veteran listeners don't even know what that is, uh, but that's another presumptive. That's uh, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, and folks, that's deadly. But but who, who would fall under that umbrella? Any veteran who's ever served 90 days or more would fall under that umbrella if they, unfortunately, become diagnosed with ALS. And you say, unfortunately, because the effect of that truly is? Yeah, death. Yeah, you're going to die. If you are a veteran and your doctor diagnoses you with ALS and you serve 90 days or more, you need to hurry up, beat feet to a credentialed service officer, whether it's at your county, your state level, or with the VA, and file a claim for it because it is going to be presumptively service-connected. But I want to touch on one that's even broader reaching than that. And a lot of you folks out there, and certainly a lot of the younger guys and gals that are coming out of service right now, are unaware that if you're diagnosed with a chronic disease within one year of release of active duty, it's also presumed that you contracted that disease or disorder while you're on active duty. What are some of those disorders? Well, that includes psychosis, anxiety disorders, and that's a pretty broad category there. Uh, for instance, PTSD is uh, listed under anxiety disorders, but there are others. Uh, dysthymic disorder, post-traumatic osteoarthritis. Now back up, we're talking about the, the chronic disorders one year after discharge. So if you have... Oh, okay. I'm, have, in, I'm in the wrong place. That's okay. <laughs> well, I uh, told you folks, we've got a lot of stuff on our plate today, so we got to shuffle around the plate and get to the right thing here. Listen, if within a year after release of active duty, your doctor tells you that, gosh, you've got arthritis, cha-ching, you have a service-connected, presumptive service-connected disorder that you need to file a claim for. The other would be diabetes or hypertension or some of the tropical diseases such as cholera, dysentery, malaria, filariasis, and I want to foot stomp here 
that these diseases, as Garen mentioned, uh, can be diagnosed after active duty, but within one year, then they're still presumptive if they're, if they're disabling to a uh, severity of 10% or greater. And what he said, you've got. This is why we ask you to grab a pen and paper. Maybe it isn't you. Maybe it's your cousin or your uncle or somebody you know that you work with that left service nine, ten months ago, and all of a sudden they say, "Wow, I just saw the doctor, and I've got. I've been diagnosed with diabetes." Would that qualify? Absolutely. Uh, again, it just has to be to the level of ten percent severity. So, uh, if your diabetes is being treated and, uh, and responding to just exercise and diet, you wouldn't get a 10% rating. But if you're on pills or anything like that, it would definitely get 10 or more. Exactly. If you are determined by a doctor to have hypertension, okay, hypertension, and they place you on medication, another qualifier. Absolutely. So that can involve a whole lot of folks. And I'm sorry, folks, but nobody's out there from the VA or the Army or the Marines or anybody telling you about this. You're hearing it here on American Warrior Radio, where we're bringing you the straight stuff right now, and it's good to go. If we're saying it, it's gospel. So if you know anybody that was diagnosed with a chronic disorder, like arthritis, diabetes, hypertension, tropical diseases like you mentioned, Glenn, within a year after they left service to a compensable degree, which means 10% or greater, then you have a well-grounded claim for a presumptive service connection with the VA and what do they got to do? They got to file for it. Well, just uh, get together the medical information that shows you are still afflicted with the particular problem and that it started within, that it was diagnosed within the year of getting off active duty. So it's key to know, I mean, you may be four years off active duty or more, and if you have medical evidence showing you were diagnosed with one of these things within a year, then uh, that, and, and it meets the 10% or greater criteria for that particular disability, you can still get this approved as a presumptive service-connected disability. Take that to the house, people. Did you hear that? Four years post-service. If you have medical evidence, and heck, if it's with the VA, it's even better, but if you have any type of, you know, qualified medical evidence that you were diagnosed within a year, you've got a well-grounded claim for presumptive service connection. Yeah, let me, uh, let me add to that. Uh, this can also affect surviving spouses. I've had a couple that came to our office and uh, in conversation with them, and that's why you have to pick apart people. That's why you need trained service officers, accredited service officers. I discovered that the veteran had a heart attack six months after he got off active duty. This was 25 years after he'd been on active duty, but he had a heart attack six months after he got off active duty. When service connected for squat, uh, so, we filed a claim for dependence indemnity compensation, uh, the surviving spouse benefit, and she got it, no problem. See, so it's this is, this is the stuff, the reading between the lines. It's out there, it's been there, but it's not highly publicized, it's not well known. That's why we really felt it important to get this to you. And we're leading to some of the uh, more prevalent issues regarding Vietnam and Agent Orange. But before we get there, you started in on the former prison of war service-connected presumptives. Yeah, now we'll uh, get to what I was talking to you out of turn there a minute ago, and that's for former prisoners of war, and those are died. Uh, it is a little different between prisoners of war who were interned less than 30 days and those who were interned 30 or more days, uh, but we're not going to go into that. Just, right, that's it's fine for, lines. Yeah, former prisoners of war, again, who get a diagnosis of one of these things rated 10% or greater. And this, there's no time limit on this. It's Correct. just being a former prisoner of war. And, and these include what, Garrett? Well, psychosis. Okay, that's a neuropsychiatric disorder. It could be a depression. It can be any number of things that a psychiatrist... Long list there are also. Oh, for sure. And obviously the uh, anxiety disorders, which you also mentioned, post-traumatic stress disorders categorized that way. Right. And uh, dysthymic disorder, that's depression. Okay, again, kind of a large umbrella. But there's some other things too, Glenn. Post-traumatic osteoarthritis. Whoa, 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 whoa. Post-traumatic? Well, in other words, while you were a prisoner of war, you, 
uh, they beat on your knee or they beat on your arms or they beat on your back and or your feet or your, your ankles. feet or whatever and now you've got problems because of that you've got arthritis in those joints and areas uh, that's post-traumatic osteoarthritis and of course osteoarthritis I'd have to look it up again to be honest this morning that's that's a special kind of arthritis condition. Garen may know what that is. Well, we'll save the medical expertise for another time. <laughs> okay. Just If you got that diagnosis, you know, and, and if you're a former POW, you know to file a claim. Uh, heart disease. What heart disease others? is a biggie. Uh, hypertensive vascular disease. That's uh, that's uh, problems with your veins, or your artery, your veins, excuse me, caused by high blood pressure. Uh Stroke, chronic dysentery, or irritable bowel syndrome. So you see, if you are a former POW or you know somebody is, and they've been through a lot already, we got to make sure that these guys and some gals, because gals can be POWs as well, get everything that they're entitled to. Yeah, and uh, let me sum up former prisoner of war presumptives by saying, if you're a former prisoner of war, Get your rear end down to see a certified veteran service officer because I'm willing to bet you're going to get service connected for some stuff and uh, you may uh, even get it all the way up to 100%. So the VA in my 22 years experience will roll over and play dead, so to speak, for, for former prisoners of war disabilities and, and, and as well they should. Now, this does not just apply, obviously, to veterans that are listening to this wonderful broadcast signal coming at you from WMEL here in Coco in the Space and Treasure Coast, because our signal, our terrestrial signal, reaches up into Volusia and over to Orange and down to Indian River. If you're outside of our immediate listening area and you're listening online in Minnesota or Tennessee or wherever, all of this applies to you, too. You've just got to connect yourself with a credentialed service officer, somebody that knows how to correctly file a claim for compensation with the VA. Yeah, and many states like Florida have service officers for the, for each county and they're credentialed. Uh, now, there are some states like Georgia and Alabama I know of that have like area credentialed service officers. They take in five or six or eight or nine counties depending on population breakdowns for those counties. But if all else fails, call the VA directly and, and go to the regional office. Don't try and do things by phone. If you're going to have to deal directly with the VA, go there and see one of the VA's veteran service officers. They have them in-house. Exactly. Now, before we get, I know all of you Vietnam vets or people that know Vietnam vets are waiting because we're going to spend a little time on that. It's one of the most viewed YouTube episodes of American Warrior Radio ever. So there's really a thirst for knowledge about Vietnam and Agent Orange related disorders. Before we get there, let's talk about ionizing radiation because another presumptive service connected disorder group. Yes, and quite frankly, uh, now I retired last August and I, in the last probably five years that I worked, I did, never saw a claim for ionizing radiation because most of those people unfortunately have passed on. Uh, just due to age, if nothing else, but uh, there's about two dozen types of cancer, including nearly every type of leukemia, bronchioavular carcinoma, that's a cancer, multiple myeloma, that's a, uh, a very rare bone disease of which I had five claims in 22 years, I couldn't believe it, that defied the odds, really, uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphomas, and primary liver cancer, uh, unless you have, well, just yeah, leave, just, it at, exactly. leave it at that. The, the, the notion there is, and it isn't just those guys and gals that were out there, predominantly guys in World War II, watching us test our atomic bombs. Right. Or the hydrogen bombs or any of that. There were others that were in specific fields that were nearby or going to be exposed. If, if you know of somebody that had to wear one of those badges to monitor radiation, Guess what? Yeah, they, they're potentially qualified. That's right. Ionizing radiation as a presumptive service-connected disorder. The other one that we want to touch on before we get to all the Vietnam stuff, because there's a lot there, is the Gulf War veterans. And these are folks that are diagnosed with medically unexplained 
you know, multi-symptom illnesses like chronic fatigue. What are some others? Uh, fibromyalgia, which is a uh, basically a nerve problem disease throughout the body. It can uh, usually it's multiple sites. Right. And irritable bowel syndrome. Right, and it's like a constellation of symptoms. If you're a PGW1 vet, because they're now calling the new class PGW2, I guess. Uh, but, yeah. <laughs> yeah. PGW1, the VA has determined that if you were over there in that area of conflict, in that eminent danger area, and you come down with some of these undiagnosed illnesses or they uh, attach these tags, chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, irritable bowel, to you, then you have a presumptive service-connected disorder. Yeah, and uh, let me say, it's not, it's not always so easy to get the VA to approve these from the Gulf War. I mean, it's even harder than usual in my experience. And so don't give up. You've got to keep fighting. You may have to fight to a couple levels of appeal uh, before you succeed with these. Uh, isn't isn't for, that what, our... for whatever the reasons are, I mean, by definition, it's tough to prove because it's undiagnosed. Now, have you ever been to a doctor and had an un and walk out the door without a diagnosis? Rare to never. <laughs> the I, the notion there is persevere. We we harp on this all the time. If you get involved in a claim process for a disability compensation with the VA, you can't just drop the ball because you get some paperwork back that you presume denied your condition or something like this. You've got to persevere. you got to continue to follow up and really press the point. Otherwise, they win. Yeah, and... They're not gonna. They're not gonna uh, appeal it for you. <laughs> well, you, I'm. I'm just curious. When's the last time anybody from the VA told you, Mister or Mrs. Veteran out there, that if you were diagnosed with a chronic disease, it was presumptively service connected? One person. Just show me one person where the VA identified you as a potential presumptive service connected disorder vet. And neither of us are VA. No, we're not. <laughs> so we're, that doesn't count. <laughs> that's right. We're giving you the information that you're not getting from other sources that you should be. That's right. Okay, so Glenn, honest to goodness, I can't even count the number of views on the YouTube episodes we've done on Agent Orange Exposed Vets. First of all, just for the benefit of those that don't know, and I would be surprised if there are anybody out there that doesn't, what's this Agent Orange business? Well, Agent Orange is really herbicide exposure, and there are several types of herbicides that were used to defoliate areas in the Republic of Vietnam and uh, also in Thailand uh, and also at a certain time around the DMZ in Korea. And exposure to that, uh, those herbicides can uh, cause a laundry list of disabilities Later on, and there's no time limit to when these disabilities show up, if they show up and you were in the wrong place at the wrong time, so to speak, then these presumptives can be approved and will be approved as a service-connected disability. So, again, that's exposure in Vietnam, boots on the ground, uh, for at least one minute of one day, and you can prove that. And Thailand, and... Right now, the VA says on, in Thailand that it only applies to like security police who are on the perimeter. However, I've gotten claims approved for people who were bomb loaders and other flight line duty things. Uh, even a CE person who happened to be in charge of dispensing the spray around the the uh, runways. Of course, and it's an, it's a case by case basis. The bottom line is, imagine an aerosol of this Agent Orange or whatever the herbicide was coming down from a plane down to the ground. It doesn't just fall on the earthen areas. It's going to go uh, off into... like uh, wind. <laughs> uh-huh, yeah. So there are blue water vets also, and brown water vets particularly. There's a list of ships that they've recognized. If you were on that ship during a very specific time period, right. you're going to be uh, presumed to have been exposed. That's right. And, and in Korea... It was being in or near, and I've always found the or near part very fascinating because I've never seen the VA define what or near was to the DMZ. How, how close do you have to be or how far can you have been uh, from that? And, you know, we want to, back on the, the ship thing, we want to uh, foot stomp the fact that there's still ongoing litigation about 
whether or not all Blue Water Navy people who were off the coast of Vietnam qualify to have presumptively been exposed to Agent Orange or not. But there is, a, as Garen mentioned, there's a growing list of ones they do recognize, and those people fit the presumptive category of having been exposed to the herbicide use. Again, how? Well, if nothing else, the when. There's other arguments being made about it. it gets into the water in the... The purification system on the ships was not set up to, to take that out of the drinking water and so forth. Exactly, and that's a big complaint, and understandably so, from so many veterans that say, well, I had shore duty. We had to take our boats in and load stuff or unload things, but there's nothing to prove it. All right. Well, good, good point. If you had shore, if your ship went in and docked in uh, Tamron Bay, and you had shore duty, you had to get off and stand on the pier and help offload whatever, uh, or onload whatever, or both. Uh, and you state that, and you can provide proof you were on that ship uh, during the period of time of the uh, Vietnam War, VA will take your word for it. And you can do that by providing... Just nobody statements, no nothing. The VA will take your word for it. As they should. But what you brought up is another good point, and that is these buddy statements or lay statements from folks that can connect you with a specific point in time having been exposed or boots on the ground. That's right. And a couple ways you can prove you were on the ship uh, is... Uh, Subject for something to come right after our break here. Uh, you hang in there with us. Yeah. We got some more information and detail on uh, herbicide agent orange exposure. And we'll talk about the uh, ships and docking at the port. Exactly. And I want to get a quick shout out to McDonald's and Satellite Beach for being such an awesome sponsor of AVET Project and American Warrior Radio. Folks, stay tuned. Right here on AM 1300 WMEL American Warrior Radio. We'll be right back. Go McDonald's!